Welcome back to Piers Morgan on Censor. The fallout from the Titan sub-tragedy continues to divide opinion, with descendants of the Titanic tragedy in 1912 saying it's time to let the wreck rest in peace. Others say all extreme adventure tourism like this, including deep dives and space exploration, needs far greater regulation to avoid disaster, but must continue. Those on the other side of the debate, including Boris Johnson, argue that all goes against the spirit of adventure that inspires humanity to ever greater discoveries. Well, joining me to discuss this is Titanic historian Shelley Binder, whose great-grandmother and great-uncle both survived the ship's sinking in 1912, and by the biologist and television host Jeff Gorwin, who is currently filming fishing in shark-infested waters and is no stranger to adventure and exploration. Well, thank you both for joining me. Uh, Shelley Binder, first of all, tell me about your relatives who survived the, the Titanic sinking. Right. Well, thank you for having me, Pierce. Um, my great-grandmother was 18 years old and was bringing her 10-month-old baby, Frank Philip, or Philly, baby Philly, to meet my great-granddad, who had come over in September of, the, of 1911 to emigrate to the United States. And her parents said if she waited three months, uh, they would agree to make up the cost of the ticket in order to send her over uh, on the safest ship ever built. And, and then, that's how she ended up on the Titanic. Right, incredible. And, and your great uncle was also on board. Yes, he was 10 months old at the time. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, and right. they actually got separated in the, in the sinking. So just to clarify, sorry, I, the great uncle was, of course, your great grandmother's child there. Is that what you're saying? Exactly, my grandmother's brother. And what then happened to both of them? Uh, so, well, um, on the Carpathia, uh, my great-grandmother was despondent and wouldn't get off of a mattress lying down and, you know, she thought her baby had been thrown overboard. And finally, after a couple of days, it was quite stormy on the Carpathia. It was a four-day journey back to New York. Uh, after several days, uh, they convinced her to go up when the weather broke to walk around the deck, which she did, and out of the corner of her eye, she saw a baby reaching his arms to toward her. Of course, he knew that was his mother because he was still breastfeeding. And she said, that's my baby. And the woman who was caring for him was an Italian lady who didn't speak much English. So a crewman said, take both women and the baby up to Captain Rostron's cabin and he will decide the issue. So Captain Rostron, played King Solomon in deciding whose baby that was. Wow. And as witness, bearing witness to this scene, were the three ladies that Captain Rostron had staying in his cabin. They were three ladies from first class from the Titanic who were all recent widows from the Titanic, Madeline Astor, um, Marion Thayer, and Mrs. Widener. And so these three ladies were witness to this uh, Solomon moment that he had. And of course, she identified some birthmarks that the baby had. And so he gave the baby to her. And Madeline Astor then said, oh, your baby looks cold and took off her scarf and wrapped it around my great uncle and uh, gave her a $5 gold piece. Amazing. What an incredible story. So then let's come full circle to what happened last week, the tragic events of the submersible. What is your view about wealthy right. people paying $250,000 to go down to the wreck of the Titanic where your relatives had this miraculous survival? I do uh, send my condolences first and foremost to all five of the gentlemen who lost their lives on that submersible and to Oceangate, who um, is suffering as well through this. Uh, you know, I've talked to many of my uh, Titanic historian friends, and I've also spoken to other descendants of Titanic survivors and also descendants of people whose family members did not live. And it's interesting to note that 
their opinions differ somewhat about whether um, extreme adventure tourism is um, applicable or appropriate in this situation. And the people whose relatives died on this ship, uh, almost universally that I've spoken to, think it's a terrible idea and are, who seem genuinely offended by it, mm. that uh, this was happening. But it's, it's interesting to note, and I'm sure you're aware of this fact, that Stockton Rush, mm. the CEO of OceanGate, his wife, Wendy, is the great great granddaughter of Ida and Isidore yes. Strauss, who both perished yes. on the Titanic. An amazing twist, yeah. So that's an interesting coincidence. Yeah, very amazing twist. So I'm assuming by that that she didn't have any problem with it. Well, we, I, I guess we don't. We, yeah, we don't know that. Um, died. Yeah, I mean, Jeff, it, it's a complicated one, isn't it? Because it's had a lot of backlash. I personally think and I've said this pretty vocally the last week, that I think that what makes this world great are people doing extraordinary things like, uh, you know, these kind of adventures, exploration, history seeking and so on. Uh, there are others who say it's just a ridiculous thing for very rich people to be abusing the ocean in this way. Where do you sit with it? Well, it's interesting, Pierce. It's, um, you know, human beings, we are hardwired to be explorers. All the incredible technological innovations that we have in our lives today, all the incredible discoveries have come from exploration, especially when it comes to the seas. But I'm in my boat right now, and I'm actually commercial fishing, taking a break to speak with uh, you guys. And uh, I have a responsibility. I have to follow the, the laws and the regulations of, of the sea, or I could be held accountable. If someone's on my boat right now and they get injured, it's gonna be my fault. So I think there's, these are, it's almost apples and oranges. Yes, it's wonderful to explore and discover and share that with humanity. And with something as sacred as the Titanic, you need to do it with an incredible amount of reverence and respect, and hopefully some enlightenment learning. But if you go there, haphazardly and expose yourself to jeopardy, there can be the ultimate price to pay for that. And we may have seen that with this vessel. Right. With this um, submersible. Right. Shelley, um, I heard that your great grandmother was so traumatized by what had happened to her that she never really recovered and that she would never get past the sound of people dying in the water and screaming out. Yes, she uh, went on Robert Ripley's radio show in 1939, and she spoke about that. And she also spoke to my father in 1960 and was quite upset and pulled him aside and said that she could never get that out of her thoughts, out of her head, the sound of 1,496 people struggling and dying in the water. Of course, it was extremely painful because the water was uh, about 27 degrees and it felt like knives being thrust into you. So many, I mean, most people, the majority of people did not drown, but they froze to death and it was a horrific uh, thing. And she could never really uh, get past that. In fact, she spent 11 months in and out of a hospital trying to gather herself with what she describes as a nervous collapse. And of course, 11 months after the accident, my grandmother was born. Right. So. I mean, of course, there's this horrible irony that these people who paid the money to go down on the submersible to see the, t the wreckage of this uh, iconic ship, they themselves suffered a, a, a a horrendous death. I mean, hope we can only hope and pray it was as instant as the experts believe it, it probably was, but a horrible irony nonetheless. Thank you both very yeah. much indeed uh, for joining me. Shelley Absolutely. and Jeff, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you.